Welcome back, BlizzCon. We're starting the day off right. Here's the World of Warcraft Deep Dive. Good afternoon, BlizzCon. So good to be back. Whether you are here in the arena with me right in front of me, whether you're watching from elsewhere in the halls, whether you're joining us from the comfort of your home, thank you for taking the time to join me for this deeper, closer look at, at what's coming next in the war within. I love you too. I love you, BlizzCon. So Morgan and Maria gave you kind of a sneak peek at some of what's coming. Today I want to spend a bit more time giving you more information on the core features of War Within, as well as a few things that didn't get mentioned at all yesterday. So beginning, yeah, just a little, little teaser there. So to begin, let's talk delves. So what is a delve? As you heard yesterday, delves are these quick bite-sized epic adventures for flexible size groups. So either solo or with up to five players. They are role agnostic, so it doesn't matter if you're a couple DPS, if you're a healer and a tank, if you're a solo healer, we're gonna make it work, we're gonna meet you where you are, how you want to play. Delves are a new end game pillar. This is a permanent addition to World of Warcraft going forward and represents kind of a capstone to the outdoor world experience. We've had dungeons, we've had raids, we've had organized PvP, and I think we've you know, had some stuff for outdoor world players to dabble in, but if you wanted progression, if you wanted goals, if you wanted a deeper, more structured experience, frankly, we were letting you down. We wanna change that. That's what Delves represent in World of Warcraft. So structuring this, really we want to approach it as something that you are going to be engaging in all season long with variety and flexibility in how you approach it and the replayability of, in the, replayability of the content is kind of a mainstay of what it's all about. Um, but also want to build in progression. Now I think if you're an outdoor world focused player, a lot of the time it's just about kind of spending your time doing a thing, going to a place, completing an event, but there aren't necessarily goals to work towards. There aren't necessarily reasons to be excited about getting an item upgrade because it's gonna let you do something you haven't been able to do before. A difficulty progression built into Delves is going to enable us to offer that. Now, there's a lot of lessons we've learned over the years from building this type of content, whether it was Torghast in Shadowlands, Island Expeditions, scenarios, you can throw in horrific visions in that list. Um, we've learned a lot about how to tune these sorts of experiences, how to design them for flexible scaling groups of different sizes, of different role compositions, about you know, what's fun and what isn't. But we've also learned, based on your feedback, about what not to do in some cases, in terms of how we structure it, how we present it. I think a key aspect of saying this is an endgame pillar is that it's an offering in parallel to the others, to dungeons, to raids. If you want to do this, if this is your jam, if this is your type of gameplay, we're there for you and we want this to be as deep as you want it to be. If you're happy running Mythic Plus and you just want to focus on that, we're not looking to add another item to the checklist of things you feel you have to do to compete. It's an alternative, unlike Torghast, which is something that you know, we did kind of say, everyone has to do this, whether you like it or not, whether you'd rather do something else or not. That gets back to some of the philosophies that Morgan touched on yesterday and how we're approaching designing and evolving World of Warcraft. We wanna meet you where you are, we wanna respect your time, we wanna offer you the ability to choose how you want to spend that time each day, each night in Azeroth. So in terms of the character of, of Delves and what, what a specific one will be like, um, the vibe here is about unraveling mysteries, it's about exploring, it's about feeling like an extension, a seamless extension of the outdoor world experience. These are not dungeons. Every dungeon is ultimately about killing a series of bosses or boss-like encounters, and the dungeon is over when you kill the final baddest boss at the end of the dungeon. And that's kind of the structure that they all have to conform to. As much as, we like, as much as we try to vary the formula a bit, that's pretty much what they're going to be. In the outdoor world, things are a bit different. We can you know, break some more of the rules. And really, at the end of the day, the one consistent thing about Delves is that they're all going to end with a room full of treasure. 
Some of those will have a final boss guardian in front of them. Others, you may be you know, just exploring, traversing the delve, flipping switches, solving a puzzle, defeating lieutenants, gathering things that you need to open the vault door. We can vary the gameplay, we can vary the feel of the experience. These are going to be instanced experiences, but they are seamless. When you walk up to you know, this, as I'll show in a second, a fog door at the entrance to a cave, at the entrance to a structure, you're just gonna walk in, no loading screen, and now you're in a delve. You wanna make sure this really feels like part of and an extension of the outdoor world. Now, as part of an in-game pillar, that means we wanna tie this into, we're going to tie this into seasons. So, as well as you know, a narrative progression over the course of a given season, um, there will be increasing rewards, increasing difficulty, and a change of pace, whether you're in season one of War Within, season two, and so forth. Part of that is going to be the NPC companion that will be accompanying you on your adventures. The season one companion, as we mentioned yesterday, is our good friend, Brand Bronzebeard. Now, what does this mean? What does a companion mean in practice? Well, it's a few things. One, it's, it's definitely it's a narrative hook. It's, it gives us a chance to help give, you give, give context for your adventures, kind of narrate what you're going through. Um, but also, it's a chance to kind of play with the mechanics and complement your play style. As Bran ventures with you, you might find some gear for Bran. You might be able to gear Bran up. You'll be able to spec him and customize his abilities to complement what you or your friends are bringing to the group, whether you want more survivability, whether you want help with someone to tank, whether you want more control. This can help us balance the experience as well and give you another vector for your progression over the course of the journey. Now, I know this has kind of been very high level. I wanna just give a couple of specific examples. It's kind of a day in the life of someone jumping into delves in War Within. So let's say you are casually journeying across the Isle of Dorne uh, and its pastoral beauty, and you come across this structure with that fog door set into it, and you decide to venture in. So as you venture in, um, you are, as I mentioned, seamlessly in the delve, and you will find, just huddled inside the entrance, a group of expedition scouts who have come to this place, they've heard reports of great secrets, great treasures, powerful relics stored within, but they've been unable to proceed further because they tell you, and Bran is among them, mind you, they tell you this place, there's, there's an unnatural, there's a disturbing darkness that has settled over this entire vault and we can't proceed. Fortunately, they have in their possession a relic that they have brought that is an enchanted candle that can light the way. It has a little light radius around it. Um, if you think back to the Vault of the Warrens dungeon, if you remember that in Legion, what the basement was like, where it really felt like a, just like a dark, scary place, but you could have this beacon in the darkness to guide your way, you have one of those. But, they tell you, it has very limited fuel. They dare not proceed on their own because they worry they're just gonna get trapped in the darkness and destroyed by the terrors within. But you, of course, being the champion who's come along, you're up to the task. So you take that candle with its light radius that will begin to shrink progressively as your limited fuel burns, and you take some steps into the delve. Now, who do you find in here? Well, as it happens, you run across fellows like this guy. Uh, this, you know, more jacked than your average cobalt, but there's a lot of cobalt in here. And as you know, as any World of Warcraft player knows, where you find cobalts, you're gonna find candles. And this guy's gonna put up a fight, but it being World of Warcraft and all, you're going to take his candle. And you're gonna take the candles of his allies and his brethren. And you know, that will help fuel this magic light that you have, help keep the light burning so that you can traverse the entire delve, defeat a couple of lieutenant type enemies, bosses, solve a puzzle or two, and at the end, you make your way into the vault room that Bran is able to open once you bring him there, and you find this mock-up um, work in progress of a treasure room, heaping with riches, tre tre treasure chests of various shapes and sizes. Some of the smaller ones, you can just walk up and open, collect a range of items, currency, rewards, you name it. Um, but you'll find a couple of extra large resplendent chests in this room. Those may require special keys to open. Now those keys you would obtain from doing kind of outdoor content, weekly quests, they're a bit more limited in how you can get them, but also allow us to offer and pace out the best rewards that are on par with some other end game content to make sure it's not you know, 
infinitely grindable or anything like that, but it's an extension of your outdoor world loop if this is your play style. Now, let's say you come back to the same delve on another day. You might find that there isn't a magical darkness settled over the place. Instead, there are earthen locked in battle with kobolds, and you can help turn the tide of that fight as you work your way through, dealing with some different challenges along the way. Variety, replayability, lots of layers to the experience. Now, so you venture back out into the zone, heading off to a different corner of it, and you come across this cave surrounded by mushrooms. Uh, it's known in legends as fungal folly. Now, maybe not being the wisest adventurer, that sounds like a great place to enter, so you take a few steps forward. In here, you might find an environment where, whether it's due to unusual ores or whatever in the walls, the rules of gravity are a bit, bit topsy-turvy. Uh, and you'll find mushrooms scattered around the cave that you can use as basically jump pads to help navigate the environment, to skip over enemies you want to avoid, to reach high up ledges that you couldn't otherwise get to. You're starting to get the idea, like, this is more the world as toy vibe that we try to play with when we're creating outdoor events, outdoor spaces. These are not mechanics you'd necessarily find in a dungeon, but I think the team really is unshackled, is freed to explore a much wider array of gameplay when we're building delves. So let's talk a bit more about the loot. So actually, before I talk about the loot, uh, sorry, these are the 12 delves that we currently have planned. Um, scattered throughout the four zones, each themed around the ecologies, each themed around the settings that you're gonna find. Now some of the attentive among you may be saying, wait a minute, Morgan's slide said there were 13 delves yesterday. He might be right, but there also might be a secret delve that you have to explore a bit more to discover that awaits you. So yeah, loot. Um, part of being a seasonal pillar means going to the Great Vault every week and, and getting to share in that disappointment that your raiding and dungeon playing <laughs> brethren have also had the pleasure to enjoy. We just, just want to make sure you don't feel left out. So you're welcome. Uh, so yeah, so you'll note, this, is, this isn't a delves row, this is a world row. And really that is enshrining these three PVE pillars, raids, dungeons, world. You'll be able to unlock some of these slots doing select outdoor world activities, as well as, of course, delves with better rewards from higher difficulty delves. Our thinking in terms of the rewards here, this is all subject to tuning, is that this should reach to, let's say, end boss heroic raid, mythic 10 to 15 type range, accessible just via solo progression. Far better loot than you've ever been able to get before. And now, I'm sure this is, you know, I know this is the delve section, but I'm sure there's folks looking at this and being like, wait a minute, what about the PVP row? <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, we got you. Um, we are removing the PVP row from the vault. We're doing that based largely on feedback that we've heard that randomness and PVP gearing maybe are not the best combination. I know it took a few years to get that message through to us. Uh, so, the way this is gonna work is instead, uh, you're just gonna get, you're gonna get a whole lot more conquest. You're gonna gear up at the same rate overall, but you will have complete control over your gearing path, just spending your conquest on the items that you want. With easier catch up, if you come in late in the season, you don't have to worry about having missed certain vault weeks. Also, if you're someone who PVPs a lot and you raid, you don't have the awkward choice of that raid trinket versus the PVP item that's gonna help your arena partners. So. Hopefully, just good news for everyone. Now aside from, you know, just power, also you get silly hats. Nothing more to say here. These just... These are just a few examples of, you know, the array of cosmetic rewards that will be exclusive to Delves, reflecting the varied ecologies and environs you're gonna be facing. So, silly hats, World of Warcraft. Less silly, um, just as, let's say, Mythic Plus players have a mount that they can earn over the course of a given season, this customizable flying mount will be exclusively available through thorough completion of the Delve experience. You note the customizability of it. Um, this will be customizable the same way you can customize your current dragon riding drakes at the rostrum, just modularly.
yeah. It's pretty cool. I love our artists. Okay. N up next. Warbands. I feel like I could probably just save 10 minutes this panel by just saying account wide everything and like just click through the next slides. But it kind of that. So I don't know if you guys know this, but turns out y'all play a lot of alts. I'm sure that num actually the number of characters per person in this room in particular is like some insane average. But the average WoW player today plays multiple characters. The two thirds, <laughs> two thirds of players who have a level 70 have multiple level 70s. Half of players have three or more. Um, most people are playing multiple characters a week. And that's not something the game, you know, it's no secret, has always done the best job of supporting. Now, part of that is because World of Warcraft 20 years ago was built with very different assumptions. And I both mean design-wise, but actually engineering-wise as well. The infrastructure and the architecture that was built. Um, back then it took hundreds of hours to level a single character, of course, and playing alt seriously was far, far from the norm. But we've kind of inherited, we're still working with, we have been working with those foundations to this day. And so when we get requests for them, when we talk about all friendliness, we aim to, we try to do it, but we're often working against, we're swimming upstream, given the underpinnings of a system that were never designed for this. And that's why you get some, frankly, pretty clunky solutions, like well, if you want to transfer this currency to your alt, go to a vendor and spend some to buy a different box that contains a countbound currency that you can then mail to yourself, log out, log back in, take the box out of your mailbox, and open it on your alt. Congratulations, you have moved 300 supplies. <laughs> Elegant design, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what if we didn't have to do that? So at its core, Warbands is, what if we just rebuilt those foundations and created a new future, both you know, for the things we want to offer today and the things we'll be able to in the future so we're not fighting against the nature of the system, but instead it complements what we want to do. Now the focus here is really making it convenient removing barriers, removing awkwardness in playing alts. We don't want to actively necessarily encourage it. People already want to do it if they do it. Um, one thing the system is not going to be is something that awards you power or makes your main more effective because you have done things on other characters or anything along those lines. If you want to play alts, do so. If you just love focusing on a single character, that shouldn't feel wrong either. Now let's talk about some examples. Okay, so I'm gonna run through these pretty quickly. They're mostly fairly straightforward. It's a bank. It's an account-wide bank. Uh, thankfully, hopefully you should never again have to mail something to yourself. Um, you also might notice, and so the, there's, this is you know, giant, lots of storage, extra tabs that can be purchased on the right-hand side, so multiple tabs of these. You can organize them as you want. The very observant, the eagle eye, will notice a little checkbox mentioning reagents. Um, if you deposit reagents here, you can craft from the account-wide storage on any of your characters. <laughs> Next up, maybe a little new thing. Uh, something that might, you might put in this account-wide storage are the ability we will now have to create war-bound items that are war-bound until equipped. You might get an item that you can't sell in the auction house or trade but that you can give to any of your other characters for their use. Now, these items um, we would drop as bonus personal loot from doing a variety of content. They would drop at a slightly lower item level than what that content would normally give you. Again, we want to make sure the right way to play is not you know, playing on multiple characters to funnel loot to your main to gear up your main faster, but just easy potential hand-me-downs Ways of getting an alt caught up, maybe even an excuse to level an alt if you get a really cool item for a class that you haven't had a chance to get up yet. So just an extra layer here, hopefully, you know, making it easier than ever to progress, to accomplish your goals on multiple characters. All right, now quick rundown of some of the other integrations we have planned. Transmog. Transmog has always been, you know, it's been for a long time an account-wide collection. Key thing here now that really it is being acquired by your warband, that means that now if you were running, let's say, Ulduar on your mage and a pair of plate shoulders drop, you can still add those plate shoulders to your warband collection. Yeah. 
Yeah. Self-explanatory. And then, you know, if you log on your warrior later, your warrior can equip them, you're good to go. Hopefully you don't need to feel like you need to refarm the same stuff on as many different armor types anymore. Reputations, again, fairly straightforward. Uh, in War Within, reputations and renowns will work account-wide. We want to make this as retroactive as possible. That will take some work over time. We're probably gonna start with Dragonflight renowns as a focus and a priority and work our way backwards. But going forward, we want progress earned on reputations to not really matter which character you're doing it on at the end of the day. It's the same content, it's the same experience. If you've gained access to some perk or some recipe, having to re-earn it, not terribly compelling. Here's a really light example, a simple one, just flight paths. As you explore the world, you learn flight paths, you discover flight paths. Is it terribly compelling to have to go back to a spot that you've already been to in multiple characters just to learn a flight path for the fourth time? No. If you have a flight path network unlocked, you have that unlocked across your warband going forward. And here's an example of you know, something new, just delves. Uh, an example of how having this as a foundation means that we can build new systems to inherently work at an account-wide level just kind of as part of their DNA. As you are advancing Bran as a companion, as you are empowering him, as you're customizing him, again, logging on to a different character and going back to having a weaker Bran that doesn't offer the tools that you've grown accustomed to, that's more frustrating than fun to re-earn those things. Let's make that progression inherently warband level, inherently account-wide. And achievements. Um, we've had account-wide achievements for a long time. You know, no secret, they have the little blue bar over them indicating that they function at an account-wide level. What Warbands allows us to do is kind of invert that paradigm and change the vast majority of our achievements to be account-wide, to have that actually be the new default. So if you do part of this PvP or crafting or other achievement on one character, part of it on another, your Warband can earn the achievement. Once your Warband earns it, you've earned it. Again, you the player are doing the thing. Oh yeah, and then this. <laughs> just to kind of signal this shift up front, there's no like mechanical functionality here, but just in terms of presentation, what you'll see when you log into World of Warcraft with multiple characters is a selection of your favorite characters huddled around a campfire or another setting. You'll still have your full list accessible but we wanna make it clear that like you, the player, have this cast of characters, that if you wanna dress them all up in consistent transmogs, go wild. Um, one thing you might note here, if you're very eagle-eyed, also by the way, if you're very eagle-eyed, don't read too much into things like the uh, evoker wearing leather. That's just, it's, inter it's, it's internal mock-ups. We're not changing anything crazy there. Um, sorry. But you will note that the evoker is level 13. That's gonna be a thing that's possible because they'll start at level 10. But um, because Dragonflight's gonna be the, the new leveling expansion, by the way, going forward. Uh, one thing you might notice is there isn't really much here about realm selection. Warbands are a realm agnostic, faction agnostic feature. You will just see all your characters here. If they're on different servers, we'll make it clear that they're on different servers. But you shouldn't have to like go to the change realm screen and swap around. They're just all here. Okay, uh, here are talents. So, um, at, our, at, at the core, this is a chance for us, as we continue to evolve and advance our class system, to explore some deeper class fantasies, to look at you know, iconic archetypes like the Farseer, or the Dark Ranger, or the Mountain King, or others often inspired by major heroes in the Warcraft universe, other times by fantasies that we've heard are really resonant with players, and focus the continued expansion of our classes in that space. Now, Morgan said this yesterday, just to restate, this is a completely flexible system. It's as flexible as your current talents and specs. Nothing like covenants or anything like that. Anytime you could change your talents today, you can change your hero spec, you can swap around your hero talents. They're just talents. Now, some of our goals here, of course, we want to offer progression, but we want to do so, frankly, while managing complexity to a certain extent. Um, when we started planning for War Within, we knew, all right, we're going to raise the level cap by 10. 10 new levels means 10 new talent points. 
the, the kind of default option for us would have been to take the existing class inspectories and just add a couple more rows to each of them, add new points to spend. But we, we've been down that path before. We know exactly where that leads 15 years ago. There's a tremendous amount, there's an insane amount of like multiplicative combinatorial complexity from adding those additional options. And it also destroys some carefully constructed choices that are really successful that we've just built up in Dragonflight today, where you can't quite have all of these things and need to you know, pick one or the other. Suddenly, when you can get all of them, it can lead towards homogeneity as well. So this approach allows us to both explore deeper class fantasy while focusing the decision space in a way that offers power without that excessive complexity. So the way it's generally gonna look is a third talent tree. Again, as mentioned yesterday, at the center of your screen, you have class, you have talent, and in the middle, you have hero talents. Um, you'll note, so there are 10 nodes. There's an initial node that you get as a starter node at the top that you'll get initially when you unlock the system at 71, and then 10 more nodes to unlock. You will get all of them on the way to 80. At level 80, you will have this fully unlocked, similar to Legion artifacts, let's say. So you don't have to agonize over you know, where you're placing any choice along the way. Now, the choices that you will make are which hero spec do you want active? And also, there will be choice nodes within the trees, just as the class trees and the, and the spec trees currently have, which you can toggle, adding quite a few permutations to the system as a whole. If you want, as a kind of simpler collapsed view, once you've hit max level, you can just condense it down to only show, show the choice nodes for easy swapping back and forth to customize your spec for whatever activity you're setting out to do. Now, I wanna take a little bit of time to quickly walk through a couple of trees to give a sense of the sorts of things you might find in here. Again, all of this is subject to change, all subject to iteration and the extensive feedback we know we're going to get. Um, I'm gonna use druids a lot as an example here. I'm gonna focus on the case of a balanced druid. Part of why the team starts Part of why the team starts with druids is because y'all are complicated. Um, we figure <laughs> there's four specs, three roles. We figure let's try some of the hardest cases first when proving out a design. It's nothing against the mages, warlocks, paladins, et cetera, but there's a reason why you probably tend to see more druid examples than other classes because we figure if we can make it work for druids, the rest will be okay. Um, the two options available to a balanced druid are this keeper of the grove tree and a Ludens chosen. Keeper of the Grove is available to Balance and Restoration. Alun's Chosen is available to Balance and Guardian. The former focuses on calling the forest to your aid, on summon treants and augmenting their abilities and what using that cooldown means for your gameplay. Alun's Chosen focuses on augmenting your lunar abilities, many of the arcane damage, moon-themed abilities for both specs. So let's look at the Keeper of the Grove tree first. Um, the first node that you're going to get as you just opt in it's just kind of a, a baseline improvement to your throughput while treants are out across the board. This just kind of emphasizes thematically what this tree is about and makes pushing that button, having the treants out more important to you in every regard. Um, some of the nodes in these trees are just gonna be simple, straightforward passives. Not everything is going to double and triple down on the same treant ability. Some will, like this, regardless of what spec you are, make your treants add additional damage. Oh, by the way, if anyone's worried, wait a minute, but what about the auto taunt? That's a mess in dungeons. We'll let you opt out of that, don't worry. Um, or, you know, passives could just augment your abilities, your resource pool, and just make you a better druid. An example of choice node, um, again, this can be about doubling down on and getting more out of having the treants active or maybe you really don't want all of your eggs in that basket. Even though you are going into this tree, you want the treants to be important to you. You don't want 100% you know, of, your, of your throughput to be focused in that window. You'd rather just have some baseline improvements to all of your abilities or to some of your core abilities. This is one of the simpler choices available, but the idea is four different opportunities to nudge your gameplay in one direction or another within this tree. A capstone talent, again, is often likely to double down on and amplify what the initial point was, just reinforcing that having the treants out is going to be a, a, a peak, a spike in your potential, something that you're going to plan around, and just amplify the overall benefits that you're achieving from that. Now, pivoting to Alun's Chosen, uh, again, this is lunar-themed and shared with Guardian Druids. So the first point here is gonna call out three specific signature abilities, two balance, one guardian. 
and make them you know, meaningfully more impactful to your gameplay. Um, if you're a Guardian Druid, for example, you might read this and realize that yeah, like Lunar Beam is going to become a pretty powerful defensive cooldown, especially in dungeons. You have a big pull going on. You're leeching a lot of damage back from what you're doing. This is now something that you can really count on and plan around as you approach your gameplay. On the Moon Kid side, this, of course, adds an extra layer to planning and you know, throughput in your rotation. Um, noting a couple of these things that we're modifying, maybe deeper optional talents in your existing spec trees. We also, where we can, want to offer ways to make sure that you can trigger those effects, even if you don't have the baseline talent, though you'll probably want to as well. So this talent um, just has Fury of Elune triggered as you're doing your regular rotation when you Moonfire, both just naturally, you know, it's a powerful effect that's going to fire more frequently, but also to the extent that the rest of the Elune's chosen tree is tying into it, you'll get those benefits as well. A couple of more passive examples here, um, again, just doubling down on magnifying your arcane lunar throughput, and a final capstone ability for this tree that is further reinforcing these core abilities that have already been augmented. I'll leave this slide up for a while. Um, these are our current plans for all 39 of the hero spec, so one per current specialization. There's some cool fantasies here to explore. I'm definitely really curious to hear community feedback on all of these, which are exciting, which are most resonant, which sound, frankly, maybe a bit lame. Um, are there any that you hoped you'd see on here that you're not seeing on here? We are you know, well underway building these out, but it's definitely early enough for us to pivot on a lot of these if there's something the community is really excited about. I want to like triple super underscore. You know, the example talents I just gave are work in progress, very subject to change, Probably no part of the game is more you know, prone to iteration, and for no part of the game is the community input more essential than class design, spec design. To that end, when we you know, move into our alpha, probably in the spring, um, we want to have as many, if not all, of these hero specs playable from the start, so that we have the entire alpha and beta window to iterate on them, to replace the things that aren't working, to dial them all in to where everyone's gonna be excited about what they're getting and more within. It's a long road ahead. We can't wait to share that journey with you and really just collaborate, discuss back and forth every step of the way. All right, now some other stuff. Some you've heard about, some you haven't. Uh, first off, Alad Race, you get to be an Earthen. Uh, awesome blinged out dwarves, or maybe not so blinged out if you want to customize them differently. Uh, these are going to be earned just by playing through the War Within campaign fully. There's no rep to grind here, nothing else beyond that. It's, you are, you are meeting the Earthen as, you know, it's, it's a first contact in essence. You're going to learn about the nature of their problems, the nature of their culture. You're going to work with them to overcome those problems, win their trust. At the end of that journey, it will make sense. It will be a natural next step for them to lend you their aid and join you as either Horde or Alliance. So yes, Horde Dwarves. We haven't yet finalized what the racial abilities are going to be, but the available classes, 10 out of the 13 available classes. Um, everything but Druid, Demon Hunter, and Evoker. Now, on the right side here, you see a concept of the heritage armor you'll be able to earn from leveling your earthen to max level. All right, dynamic flight. <laughs> so it was obvious very early on in Dragonflight, um, probably before Dragonflight even released in beta, that we could never go back to how it used to be. <laughs> Honestly, we hoped that would be the outcome. We hoped the feedback would be, this is so awesome, we just want this to be how flying works forever. Um, but we immediately began you know, making plans for, for what that would mean, because you know, it's, just, it's, the only way, it's the only way to go. And so yeah, dragon riding is going to become the default, no longer just dragons, uh, but dynamic flight now in War Within and beyond. We want to make sure. Oh, weird. I, 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 I meant to have two mounts here, but I only see ashes on the right. But anyway, um, 
the key point being, we want to expand this to the broader array of mounts that you have available. I think the only downside of dragon riding as it exists today is that you don't have much reason to use so many of the mounts that are your favorites visually, aesthetically, that you've earned and done so much to, to collect. You wanna make sure that as much of your collection is viable as possible. So not every single flying mount is gonna be able to support dynamic flight. There's some you know, animation logistics to work with there, but as many as we can, it's a three digit number. We want a very wide array of mounts being able to just fly the way you've always you know, enjoyed with your dragons. Um, and just to clarify, like this is the future of flying. So everywhere that you can fly today, you will be able to dynamically fly or dragon ride. In fact, not just in, in The War Within, a uh, little sneak peek, I think in our upcoming 1025 update, you'll be able to dragon ride in Eastern Kingdoms, Kalimdor, Northrend, Outland, you name it. We also, want, we also understand there are some folks um, for accessibility reasons, personal preference reasons, maybe you just like being able to AFK in, the, in midair, that you know, dragon riding isn't your favorite, we don't want to take anything away. We want to let all these mounts that can currently you know, do the old school flying mode toggle between dragon riding or let's call it TBC flying. Up to you, whatever you prefer. And again, to be clear, to be clear dynamic flight will be available from the very start when you go to Castle Gar in the Isle of Dorne, just as it was in Dragonflight. Old school TBC flying, Pathfinder style, will not be available right away, but it will be unlocked shortly after reaching max level with no reputation grind requirements. Just play through the campaign, explore the continents, then you can fly that way as well. Um, the existing dragon riding glyph system in the Dragon Isles, um, we, we want to pivot that to a bit more of something that's evergreen. Some of those unlocked traits may, may change to only work within the Dragon Isles, Others that are, that are more essential to just the experience feeling good, like vigor increases, regenerates, the active abilities, are just gonna be things that you will inherently get as you earn dynamic flight and level up naturally. We don't want down the line players to feel like they have to go back to an old expansion and fly around and collect a bunch of glyphs just to be able to explore the new expansion. And in that vein, this is going to be the new default for leveling players. I mentioned earlier, um, when War Within comes out, instead of BFA, Dragonflight will be the new leveling experience that you merge into as a new player after you leave Exile's Reach. And so you're gonna get dragon riding very early in that experience. As you just level up, gain player levels, you will improve your flight ability and get all the vigor perks and everything else that everyone has come to expect. And that's just gonna be how the game works as a baseline. This is what flight is now. Don't worry, PVPers, we haven't forgot you. Um, this is long overdue. We, we, we really, we should have been doing this earlier. So there's a new battleground coming in War Within. It is a 10v10 map set in the Ringing Deeps. Um, this is inspired by Silver Shard Mines with a few twists. The Ringing Deeps are a place that's full of natural resources, that very sort of thing that the Horn Alliance would be likely to skirmish over. Um, I'm gonna show you a very rough, early, kind of like top-down, mock-up of the layout here. Um, the idea is, unlike Silver Shard Mines, which is radial symmetry, this is more you know, mirrored and re re reflects the two sides trying to both push their own minecarts to collect resources while also fighting over a pivotal central control point that's gonna change the outcome and the momentum of the match. Um, this is something that the team has actually been playtesting internally a bunch over the last couple of weeks, having a blast with. When we make battleground maps, we don't really artify them. We keep them really rough, which is why I don't have any good images to show just yet, because it really is all about the layout. There's no point in making it look pretty if the spacing isn't correct, if the exact paths aren't correct. That's gonna be the next step. Can't wait to get this in front of everybody to start testing in alpha and beyond. And this isn't just a one-off. We wanna keep adding new battleground maps going forward. This is an essential part of the game. And you know, I mentioned 10v10, but we are just about to undertake a little 8v8 solo queue RBG exper experiment in 10-2 in a week or two. 
So depending on how that goes, you may be experiencing this one at 8v8 as well. So stay tuned. Um, otherwise, we have you know, a few ongoing interface updates that we're continuing to work on. You know, in Dragonflight, we overhauled the, the HUD, the action bars, the unit frames, the baseline UI experience. We made it clear at the time that that was just the beginning. This is something we want to continue chipping away at, updating different pieces of the UI to be more streamlined, better reflective of the modern gameplay experience. So just a couple of examples here. Um, so the Spellbook, we are looking to modernize, update, actually take, make use of you know, more than like a 1024 by 768 monitor resolution. Uh, <laughs> ideally, you're not gonna have to you know, flip through multiple pages to find some ability that's not on your action bars. Also, we're combining this with our talent screen. If you look at the tabs at the bottom, you have spec, talents, and spells all in one, one place, so it's kind of a one-stop shop for all the things that your character has available rather than having two separate windows that you need to move between. Uh, some light, light updates here, I think, you know, improving the overall aesthetic of the quest log, the quest window. Um, think if This is harder to show off just in a single screenshot, but we are adding a bunch of filters to allow you to hide and show different objectives, to see more quests that are available at once, to you know, filter your log for the things you care about most. We also have a full pass in progress on our quest iconography to make it easier to differentiate between daily and weekly quests and remove you know, our reliance on just shades of color as much as we do, which really, it is a color blindness issue for you know, the range of quest bangs where the only difference is what color it is. Um, and again, this is just a couple of examples of ongoing efforts. We really, this is a project that will never be done. We're just gonna continue improving and updating different aspects of the UI as we go. Yes, so this, this one basically speaks for itself. Uh, you know, I've mentioned earlier, you know, your warband is a cross-realm construct. Increasingly, so many of the activities that players engage in socially span multiple realms. You have a ray group, you have a mythic plus group that you run with, group that you PvP with, but you can't be in the same guild together not any longer. That's a thing that will change when War Within comes out. Apply, recruit, server shouldn't matter when it comes to joining a guild, when it comes to being in a guild, when it comes to accessing the perks of being in a guild. And people may be wondering, wait a minute, what does that mean if now guilds are cross-realm? What about mythic raiding? If, well, if your guild is cross-realm and your guild wants to raid mythic, you should be able to do that day one. So no more realm restrictions there. The Hall of Fame will still exist, just kind of as a you know, memorial of accomplishment, but it's not gonna be tied to unlocking anything anymore. That's just there day one. And really, just philosophically, this is another step towards one of our goals of just tearing down barriers, making the game as social as possible, making it as easy as possible to play with who you want to play with, regardless of your server, regardless of your faction, as much as possible, if you want to play WoW with somebody, let's make that happen. All right, so that brings us to the end of this whirlwind tour slash deep dive of War Within Features. Um, I know there's still a bunch of questions, a bunch more information to share. Can't wait to do that in the coming days and weeks. But to begin, I'd like to invite everybody, if you have questions, if you're here at BlizzCon, go to the Darkmoon Fair in Hall D. You can drop off questions there. If you're, you know, just go, if you're going online, you can go to the WoW or WoW Classic subreddits or our official forums and either ask your questions there or upvote others. This coming week, when we get back to the office, we're gonna huddle, review the top questions, and record streams for both Classic and for War Within, addressing the top questions to try to get as much information out there as possible. So. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to begin this journey together with you. Can't wait for the war within. Enjoy the rest of BlizzCon, enjoy the rest of the weekend. I love you all.